I was reminded that I neglected to introduce myself. Um, my name is Jose Oliva. I'm the program director. Hi. <laughs> I'm the program director at the Restaurant Opportunity Centers United, Rock United. Uh, and I'm also a member of the policy committee of Labor Notes. Um, next, we're going to be hearing from uh, Larry Hanley. So on my way to the public schools, I took public transit. <laughs> and I got to tell you, it feels beautiful to be swimming in this uh, sea of orange t-shirts here today. Um, so Larry Hanley was elected president of the Amalgamated Transit Union, which represents bus drivers and mechanics across the U.S. and Canada in the fall of 2010. He ran on a platform of organizing the members to save mass transit, a, pro a project that the incumbents seem oddly uninterested in. Um, since then, he's reorganized the union's priorities to put building community coalitions at the top of the agenda, training locals how to reach out to riders. They've held boot camps and, uh, that bring together ATU members and community organizers to train them how to build coalitions. In pursuit of the goal of saving transit, Larry has been a bit of a troublemaker. Yeah. 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 When some union leaders were backing the Keystone XL pipeline, he said no. That's right. We don't need more dependence on oil. We need mass transit, which creates jobs that last, not temporary ones. The ATU has brought 83 members to this conference, a record for the ATU. Yeah, you'll likely be sitting next to them in a workshop. Uh, so say thank you to them for saving transit, and uh, I welcome Larry. Don't rub it in. I mean, come on. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I, how many people are wearing those shirts that are not ATU? I'm just curious. <laughs> One, that's pretty good. Two, three, four, okay. Uh, I want to thank Jane Slaughter uh, uh, for the work that you do. Where's Jane? Back here. Thank you. And Labor Notes, Labor Notes for consistently reporting on stories that the mainstream media uh, and often the labor media don't cover, for telling the stories, really. Thank you, Labor Notes, and for putting together this conference. Um, back, back in 2005, I was also honored to be included, uh, to the story of my local, to be included in the Troublemaker's Handbook too. And one of the nicest things I ever got was a little certificate that declared me a troublemaker, and I want to thank you for that as well. <laughs> I have a bunch of notes here, but I'm going to deviate from them because I, I really think that the story I want to tell, and we'll tell this more at our panel at 10 o'clock for those of you who can come, is the story not of what I'm doing, but what has been spawned throughout our international union. And that is the notion, first of all, that the fight we have is bigger than our union alone. The notion that the people who share an identical interest with us the workers in transit systems are the people who use them and rely on them every day. There are far more riders than there are workers involved in the system. And it would be just plain dumb of us to watch what is happening to transit around the country and assume that that fight is ours alone. What we've watched over the course of the last two years is more than just a neglect of the transit systems. It has been an attack on them. We have seen service in this city in one day cut 14%, with very little fight back, by the way. In 85% of the cities in America, transit fares have gone up, or service has been cut, or both. And in places like New York City, which is the most transit-dependent city in America, service has been cut in the last two years that ran for 100 years before that. And where is the voice standing up on behalf of the people who ride the systems. Who is going to go out and organize that voice? And what more likely group to do it than the other group of people who depend upon those systems, and that is the transit workers in both the ATU 
and the TWU, and I want to recognize John Samuelson, who's here from Local 100, who has, who has been a partner in this fight from the beginning. But also, I want to tell you that in this room, we have a large contingent of our members from the Chicago Locals 241 and 308, but also, also we're joined by people from our union who've engaged in the struggle you might have heard of, and that's our people from Wisconsin who are here, who have, who have I think, given us examples of how you can go out and get people, including farmers, who are not directly affected by the state pension system uh, to get out there and fight on behalf of public sector workers. We also have people in this room in our panel, we'll talk about that, from Pensacola, Florida, and from Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah. And the story they have to tell is what they've done over the course of the last year in organizing their passengers and organizing their members and fighting back against a multinational corporation called Veolia, yeah. whose only purpose is to crush working people. And in, yes. And in Phoenix, they were successful because of the community efforts that they made and the strike that they had in beating back Veolia's demands for concessions. In Pensacola, they were successful in throwing Veolia out of town. We have, we have officers here from Fall River and New Bedford in Massachusetts, two little towns where Lizzie Borden came from, for those of you old people. <laughs> Fall River in New Bedford, where's she from? Fall River, okay. But these are locals with limited resources, with small memberships, who last summer got together with the Labor Council and their community and got a part-time organizer to get on their buses and organize their riders to fight for more service. And right now, while service is being cut throughout the country, True. they're adding service in Fall River in New Bedford. <laughs> We're joined also by folks from Springfield, Massachusetts, where they're doing the same thing to organize the riders. And our folks from Michigan are here who have had an endless battle over the course of the last year and a half. And we continue to thank you for the work you do. We have folks here from Seattle who don't have the afflictions that many of the folks I talked about have, but nonetheless are fighting back by organizing community coalitions to preserve transit and fight to expand it and also our Greyhound workers who have been fighting for the last 30 years for dignity and respect on the job. <laughs> and also Baltimore, Washington, D.C. I probably missed some of our locals that are here, but I just want you to know that what we did, and we started in this, oh, I'm sorry, the train workers at BART are represented. <laughs> Oakland, California. Thank you. So, so here's the deal. Uh, much like the story you just heard about the teachers here in Chicago, we have recognized the national problem is that we have to reach out beyond our own union, beyond our own capacity. And among the things we've done is we held our first boot camp right here in this hotel, where we introduced 40 local union presidents to their counterparts in the community around the country. And we asked them to try and build coalitions. We then offered resources from the international union to help in coalition building all around the country. I've told you of some of the successes that were spawned by that. But also, we recognize that we can't have the resources within our union to do this alone, and we have now formed a nonprofit organization separate from the union for the, for the express purpose of going out and building transit passenger organizing committees all over the United States and Canada. And we're going to be doing that. That is going to be the focus of our effort. So, you might say, why? And I probably only have time to give you one really good example. And that is the guy you were talking about before, the mayor of Chicago. Ah. Well, give him credit. He's a powerful guy. He was the political director in the Clinton White House, am I right? And then he left and he spent a couple of years making about 15 million bucks on Wall Street. So he was able to make that kind of money in two years, unlike the Chicago teachers. What are you doing wrong? What are you doing wrong? But then he did a second stint in the White House for President Obama, chief of staff, one of the most powerful roles 
not only in this country, but in the world. And while he was there, he did nothing <laughs> to lift a finger to save mass transit while it was getting screwed all around the country. But that's not really what I want to tell you. <laughs> we, our contract expired here in Chicago at the end of last year. In preparation for the contract, normally the union does some things and the companies do some things. And the first thing that we got from Claypool, who's the head of the CTA here in Chicago, was a statement in the paper. And by the way, there were illusions from City Hall that this was true. But he went out and listed seven or eight things that we have in our contracts here that are just outrageous. And I forget what they all were. But the one that really sticks in my craw, and the headline in the newspaper, and you may not know this, and you all that aren't in the ATU are going to be jealous <laughs> when you find this out. Matter of fact, you all in the ATU are going to be jealous when you find out what we got in Chicago. <laughs> you may not know that we have a paid coffee break. Yeah. When we report to work, the minute, the minute that a transit worker reports to work in Chicago, they get a 10-minute paid coffee break. Did you know that? But we don't. <laughs> but, but, I want a pee break. but that, hey. <laughs> no, no, but I'm getting to a punchline, and there's a lesson in this. No, there really is. There really is. So, this very powerful guy, um, through Forrest Claypool, made the statement in the paper that we get this paid coffee break. And I got a call immediately from a guy named Hilkovich over here who writes for the Tribune. And he wanted to know about this uh, outrageous paid coffee break. And I said, gee, <laughs> I want to know about it too. <laughs> so, so I did a little uh, sleuthing, a little investigation, looked into the contract, and what did I find out? Now, you all are not going to be so jealous when you hear this. It was the 10 minutes that a bus driver or train operator get when they come to work to check out the steering and brakes. OK? I just heard right from Jackie from Washington, because they get that too. It's not unusual. It's actually a thing that's required by law that before a bus driver pulls a bus out in the streets of Chicago, they make sure they have brakes and steering. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's not the punchline. Here's the punchline, and it's something I hope you carry away as a lesson from very powerful people. When a very powerful mayor in Chicago decided that it was time to take on these greedy bus drivers and greedy transit workers, he knew with all the friends he has, and all the money he has, and the power he has, and he outspent his opponent 10 to 1, he knew he couldn't beat us up without a coalition. And he went out to form it. And his coalition was going to be with our riders and with other taxpayers. When do we all die as citizens and become taxpayers? <laughs> right? So, so he went out in an attempt to form a coalition and distorted reality and accused bus drivers of sitting around having coffee when they're checking their steering and accused train operators of the same thing when they're checking out their trains. But the important lesson in the punchline is really that no matter how powerful you think you are, take a lesson from the mayor of Chicago. Take a lesson from the words of Dr. King. We cannot walk alone. We thank need, you. thank you. We need to go out, we need to go out beyond our own borders, beyond our own limits, especially in this global economy, and find ways to work with others, particularly those that have the same interests that we do. So I just want to, well, no, can I tell you one more story? Do I have time? Yeah. Two minutes. So I go out to Ohio for the battle in Ohio, and it was great. Wasn't it great what the Ohio folks did? Yeah. Well, when we began that, we had a meeting in Dayton, and I flew back to Washington, 
and I'm sitting on a plane next to a guy who turns out to be a minister in a church in Washington, D.C. And we struck up a conversation, and we really hit it off. And we talked about all the things that were going on in Ohio. We talked about the right-wing attacks on working people, and his church is full of working people. We talked about our mutual disappointment in the federal administration in what President Obama has been able to do thus far. And it was a very tender conversation. Because let's be honest, despite any misgivings we have, and we do, if the other side ever took over this country, we would have Ohio in every state. So we had, I, I asked him, I said, well, he's an African-American minister. And I asked him, you know, what he thought about the administration. He said to me, don't tell my wife. <laughs> but he said, I'm disappointed. And I said to him, what happened to the Dr. Kings? Where are they today? Where are the leaders that are willing to put themselves on the line? Just heard Malcolm X. Where are the Bobby Kennedys? Aside from the fact that those two guys got murdered. No, seriously, where are they today? And he thought for a minute and he said to me, you know what? He says, we preach a safe gospel. That's right. What he said. And I've been thinking about that ever since. So with that in mind, I hit the road recently and I went out to meet with the local officers, local members. I spent a great deal of time, spent 12 days going from local to local on the West Coast, listening to members. And I just want to tell you what I heard from members at union meetings. First, and this isn't consensus thinking. This is just members saying things to me that stay with me. We have no faith in our union. Our, this is one member said this. Another member said to me, this is in a group, in the meeting. We feel hopeless. Another one said, we're afraid. I said to them, you know what? Think for a minute, if you can, of what the moment was like the day that Rosa Parks got arrested. How did she feel knowing? And think about this for a minute, that after she refused to do what so many had agreed to do, to move to the back of the bus, that her family would probably say, Rosa, why didn't you just move to the back of the bus? Why didn't you just follow the law? How did she feel as they were putting cuffs on her? Was she afraid? I'll bet she was. Anyone here ever get cuffs on? It's a scary thing. But somewhere inside of her, she said, we have to fight injustice, and somebody has to start it. We can't wait. And remember, too, that Dr. King and the whole notion of a nonviolent movement, remember what that was really about? There were a lot of things it was about, but at the core of it was the idea, you're never going to convince a racist. Don't waste your time. Yeah. Right? But if you can remain nonviolent, if you can find a way while they're beating you and fire hosing you, if you can maintain your dignity and you can go out and show the rest of the world how wrong it is, how unjust it is, what is happening here in America, then you will win, over time, the sympathy of the majority. And that, and I, I know I'm over time, so I'll sum it up this way. The mission that the ATU is on is to win over the majority. And our little piece of this world are the people who ride transit. And you will see the ATU not only doing it, but thank you, succeeding at it. And we will be out there on picket lines and protests. But in addition to that, we'll be out there doing the quiet work every day that's about getting our passengers involved in their own problem, getting them to stand up on their own issue, understanding that, understanding that we are all in this together. 
And finally, a union's role and a union officer's role is not to move paper and move grievances, it's to move people. And, and the, job that, the job that lays before us is not one of being an administrator, it's of being a leader. It's one of inspiring people to do things they would not otherwise do. It's having courage to stand up and say things that are often unpopular. And it's having the way and the will to teach others to find that place inside themselves that Rosa Parks found, to have the courage to say no to injustice. And I thank you for joining me in that.